Banishment. Before it was called Looking Glass, uh, back in uh, from 91 to 96, and since then I've been at Harmonix Music Systems. And uh, one of the one of the themes of this podcast is uh, I've be, I've been calling it looking for authorship. So going through the games, talking to different people who may not have been identified as the sole author of the game, but part of the idea is that there isn't a sole author of the game to try to explode that notion and just talk about maybe interesting moments you remember, interesting problems, and uh, you know who was responsible for them, stuff you specifically remember doing or that you remember other people doing. Uh, I know, for example, you mentioned something on your blog recently where you were talking about bugs in Underworld 1, and you mentioned the Pac-Man Mm -hmm. uh, Pac-Man moment and, and, and I remember who you said that that was the, the brainchild of a particular person or it how? was a programmer uh, yeah his name is John Mayara okay um, yeah I mean, shall I talk about just sort of the underworld I, design I, I, I think like, I, I think we where can, that came from I think we can yeah we that's definitely probably the first place we want to go I, I, I was wondering if we could maybe start with a little bit more background about uh, maybe your memory of how you got into the company. I know you were a student at MIT, right? And just kind of how that all came about and how you get in. Yeah, that's really where it all started. Um, there was I, so I was at MIT um, in the late 1980s, early uh, 1990s, which makes me an elder statesman by now. And uh, there was there were these computer clusters, and which were supposedly for doing homework and things like that. But of course, everyone, lots of people use them to play games. These were mostly text games like NetHack and Moria and, and stuff like that. And you could see, um, of course, who was playing games because you could look over everybody's shoulders and see all the monitors. So there was this sort of informal community that developed of people who played games late at night in the computer clusters. And uh, some of those people were programmers, uh, computer science students like myself. Um, one of them was Doug Church, who ended up being a big you know, computer game guy. Another one was a guy named Terry Donahue, who is now a priest. Um, and he was super smart guy. He's a priest? He is now a priest. Oh, wow. um, smarter than either me or Doug. And he was writing a game by himself uh, called X-Tank, um, where it was like a top-down vector graphic style tank game where you could like go around and you know have do combat and one of the neat things about it was that uh, you could program the tanks yourself so you could write C code to run AI for a tank and you could run AI battles against uh, tanks and Doug and I were working on some of that um, uh, with him he would give us stuff to do, like, oh, why don't you like, design and code this subsystem and we would do it. There was one uh, mode of X-Tank which actually ended up becoming more popular than the tank battle thing, which was a sort of an ultimate Frisbee simulator. You would have um, your tank uh, would have like a disc like circling around it and you could like, uh, you could grab it and you can release it and go fly it. I'm mm. flying off at a tangent, you try to get into a goal. And I wrote an AI for um, uh, an ultimate, an X tank ultimate playing robot, uh, which ended up being this awesome AI, it could completely destroy people because it would calculate exactly what it had to do and like thread the needle between various obstacles. Was, oh, wow. It was awesome. So anyway, um, I, I, I'm getting to a point here, uh, and I had also taken uh, an AI class at MIT as just part of the curriculum. Anyway, so Doug was a year ahead of me, and he. Uh, left and then he he briefly I think had like one year like doing like like military sim work or something and then like a friend of a friend was starting up this game company at the time it was called Blue Sky Productions and um, Doug got an in there and so he became one of the programmers there. This is when uh, there were like five people there and they were starting on this game called Underworld. It wasn't Ultima Underworld yet. Um, so the license came later. The license came later, yeah. Although I think it was there by the time I joined. So then a year later, I graduated, and Doug told me, hey, we need an AI programmer, and you took an AI class, and you like wrote this like ultimate Frisbee tank AI. Why don't you come be our AI programmer? I said, sure, that sounds great. I mean, I had been um, you know, an Ultima 
fanboy since I was a kid. Too. So, so this was amazing. So that, to... was, so that was part of the draw for you was the Ultima. Oh, totally. Yeah. Yeah. I was really, I was actually really interested in the, um, just a little bit about, uh, so when you got, I'm interested at the state it was in when you, um, when you came on board. Like, so, so it had, it was originally started out as something that wasn't an Ultima thing. It was just like a dungeon thing. And then it became like an Ultima thing. And then, like what? Right. I think I think it might have the plan might have been all along to try to make it an Ultima thing. The uh, the CEO of the company, Paul Nurath, had done a game called Space Rogue for Origin, so he knew people at Origin who, of course, were doing the Ultima games. Although they had never done, they had never, I think, let a third party do an Ultima game. You know, it had all been in house stuff, yeah, like so. run by, yeah. Uh, Richard Garriott at Ward British. Even though they had some spin-offs like, uh, like Martian Dreams and stuff, but they, right. weren't, but they were still in-house. I think they were yeah. still in-house, and that was right before, um, that was right around the time, those came out right around the time that I started uh, working there. So I think his plan all along was to try to get Origin to uh, put it in the Ultima series mm -hmm. somehow, um, but if that didn't work out, we probably would have found some other yeah. license or some other publisher and, mm -hmm. and started some other thing. So at the time that I joined, yeah, it was already an Ultima. There wasn't a plot or anything. Um, it was basically a 3D dungeon simulator. And the we were basically trying to put in features first and try to figure out what worked and what didn't in terms of an environment and what kind of things you could do and even what kind of what kind of things a player could do and what kind of things we as programmers could, sure. could do technologically. And, uh, and then sort of put a plot and things like that on later. I'm interested in that actually as a, as a kind of a design process because my take on a lot of the later uh, Looking Glass work is that there's obviously a premium put on like trying to make something a coherent world and with a lot of kind of simulation aspects to it. And I've heard Underworld called like a dungeon simulator almost before being a dungeon game, and I'm wondering, yeah. was that and it was chronologically you know, a dungeon simulator well, before it was a dungeon game? Well, exactly, and I, that's an interesting design process because I feel like some people would advise against that and say, like, you should you should really think about the game, and then, but you were kind of thinking about it as a simulation first, and how did that work for you? Yeah, I might advise against it too. Um, uh, I think uh, later on, if we get to Terra Nova, like, I think that that it didn't work so well. Um, in that case, I we think... We should talk about that. Oh, actually. We'll, we'll get there, okay. um, whether I want to or not. Uh, in a lot of ways, it was very powerful because it gave us the freedom to make the game and the environment like as good as it could be and like sort of optimize that mm -hmm. um, according to how well all of that stuff worked instead of worrying about how we could implement certain things that we had decided had to be in here. On the other hand, it meant that actually coming up with the the plot and, and the feel of the game at the end was a little bit ad hoc. I mean, and if you look at the, the plot of Underworld at the end, it's not actually particularly coherent, right? It's like this random, uh, you know, set of quests that's kind of shoehorned into the ultimate. I don't ultimate. Even remember. What, there's like a princess or something on like the bottom of the dungeon. and then Right. Like you get, so you arrive in Britannia and the princess has been abducted and they think you did it because you just showed up and they throw you. And there's this guy, the Baron Ulmerick. And he yeah. has, he has Richard Garriott's voice. He does. Strang for, strangely, yes. I remember. I remember thinking he, he was Lord British, but he's not. Right. right. No, no, Richard wanted a, a cameo. So, okay. So he got that. Um, and then it's this kind of standard Ultima Quest thing of, you know, do find things corresponding to the eight virtues and, and stuff like that. But Oh, I remember the, looking for the flute forever because I yep. think you have to, like, do something for the yeah. cup, I think. Yeah, I think it's you like, play the flute play the in the flute. right place and you oh have to play God. the right me melody or something. Oh I had no friends helping right. me play that game, and I remember, right. like, figuring out everything by myself, right. and that was really hard. So, so you were asking about authorship. I mean, not only did the authorship of the game game sort of as a game come after all the simulation stuff it also didn't really have um a single author um we had paul had hired someone like a, a contractor who is like an actual writer mm -hmm. um in i was making air quotes there <laughs> to um 
to come up with the plot and the dialogue and, and all of that stuff. And that just did not really work out. He was too far removed from from what we were doing and, and uh, it just didn't, there was a, a mismatch there. So we ended up all basically designing the game and writing all the dialogue ourselves. So when you say yourselves, was it mostly programmers? Programmers, programmers artists? and artists. Really, everybody? Yeah. So so how- Everybody got, a, each person got a level. Oh, okay. So, so, <laughs> Basically. So you would have an artist and would you be doing art and programming work on all the levels, but then in terms of writing each person, regardless of their other role, was given a level? Is that how it worked or? We were, so I mean, the programmers were doing programming, the artists were doing art, but in terms of uh, creating the level, creating like the geometry of the level, um, coming up with the dialogue, um, coming up with sort of the the stories, the plots of that level, like oh, this person, okay. uh, you know, lost their, you know, Something. their their favorite, you know, toaster, and you have yeah, to you know, like, yeah. go find it over on this other floor and stuff. So each person basically wrote their own level, and so the levels all like a lot of them look pretty different and and have different sorts of plots. I was sort of the person who then tried to take all of that and put it into a I coherent, <laughs> semi-coherent whole that made some sort of sense. So I like edited all of the dialogue and I oh, like added okay. some references between um, stuff. We didn't have any like designers per se. It was I all see, just I like see. programmers and oh, artists. So that's, so it's actually really, so, so you're an interesting person to talk to then for like trying to manage, trying to create a coherent story out of out of it. At least that's what you were trying to do by kind of wrangling a lot of the other content. Right. It kind of went both ways, right? We said, okay, we'll we'll need these eight quests. Okay, we'll put this quest on level five. You get this quest on level seven, and mm -hmm. then and then after everybody had done their parts, we I kind of tried to knit it back together. Did did you? I mean, do you rem do you remember thinking it worked, or did you? Did you, were you happy with it or because as a player I was I'm just wondering how it was to that's great <laughs> I think that we well it was a weird group also because most of us were like right out of school and this was the first commercial program we had done so I think we all kind of um, felt like unprofessional in some weird way so like I've written this, therefore it can't possibly be as good as the stuff that like professional game designers in the in the past have made. So it all felt, I think, to us fairly kind of patched together and and random. But it still, I think, ended up we were pretty like happy with where it ended up. I think it's not really the most coherent um game, but probably people had a lot more tolerance for that back in nineteen 92 or whatever you than mean they would now. Of overarching story when you say coherent? In terms of our overarching story in terms of of like when you went into a, a level what that level would be like you know I remember there was like some lower level with like tons of like lava chasms and stuff and it was like it kind of felt like a different game mm -hmm. uh, kind of from from stuff above that's probably something the kind of thing that we because we were so close to it we would see that and say well this feels really weird and probably someone who just picks up the game and starts playing is like, whoa, now I'm in a level with lots of, you know, lava chasms. That's awesome. Yeah, uh, that's that's definitely how it was. Oh, I remember thinking it was because you were down farther. You were like, sure. It's like at the right. bottom of the, of the Right. Of I mean, it was, yeah, it was done <laughs> intentionally. It just, it felt that level to level things were kind of different, you know, and for example, we said earlier, there is this Pac-Man level. Like, yeah, what's, yeah, yeah. What's that there for, you know? So it was all, um, it, it uh, did not, really make the most sense when taken as a whole, but somehow like it, it worked out okay. Well, I mean, it's also a game about exploring an unknown place. So there's kind of an eclectic feeling to the whole right. experience. It's like, oh, what's this level gonna be? And what's this level gonna be? And they're all very different. Right, and we kind of took that to a, an extreme later in Underworld 2 when we explicitly had different yeah. worlds, different dimensions, and didn't yeah. try to pretend they were all in one spatial place. Oh, that's interesting. Do, do, are you saying that maybe the desire, the decision to make Underworld 2 about explicitly different dimensions came from the variety that that was in the first game and like wanting to make that make more sense or was I it didn't work so much on the design of Underworld 2 but I think that that was um there was definitely a design like we knew that we could do lots of things with different kinds of environments mm -hmm. and uh it seemed like a good idea to make that sort of make some sort of narrative sense yeah 
in some way. Okay. Um, there was something. So there was just a, a few questions I had. So um, there was there's this crazy thing in, in Underworld One, which is like there's this these, these lizard people that have their own language that right. you have to learn. And I'm I'm wondering if you if you rem have any memories of that or like because you actually have to write it down. There's like nothing in the game that's actually helping right. you remember what they what they their language. Yeah. Well, the, so here's another thing where we were not very like professional game designers. It's like there was information that. Uh, people would like give you once, and then if you asked them about it again, they'd say like, "I already told you that." Yeah, <laughs> like, that's not very yeah. good game design. But it was more realistic, right? We were trying to make everything realistic because yeah. it was this, it was this simulator. Yeah, the lizard man stuff that was, um, that was uh, uh, all done by a, a programmer uh, named uh, JD who used to uh, be like a tech guy at Infocom before um, Blue Sky, and. Um, yeah, that was just like the kind of design that we were that we were doing back then. We're like, hey, it's a puzzle, and and we're not going to spoon feed it to you. It's it's hard with it's it's very hard with puzzles in general. Um, and I've found this also in like stuff I've done on the side writing interactive fiction. It's very hard to tell how difficult a puzzle is. Um, and one problem that I I often have is that I think in order to make a puzzle interesting, I have to make it fairly difficult. And then it turns out that it's actually way more difficult yeah. than I thought. And in fact, people really enjoy puzzles of the form, like this door is locked and there's a key in the next room, go find it and pick yeah, it up yeah. and bring it back. And a lot of Ultima type puzzles, which we put in Underworld as well, were basically, um, you know, just like quote puzzles of the form like oh i need a loaf of bread so i'll go to the baker and mm. he can't make the bread because he doesn't have flour so he told tells me to go to the next village and get the flour and i get it and bring it back you know there's no yeah. like it's not there's it's no not puzzle a, to be solved you're just like going yeah. around sort of doing busy work and so we were trying to do things that were more interesting than that for example oh you have to learn the lizard man language on your own and uh, i think that some of that you know put extra demands on the player that did you ever did you ever get any feedback from anybody that they dislike that or that that was a barrier for some players or because I know that that's a while after you get into the game so you're kind of acclimatized to like the vibe of the game by the time yeah. you actually encounter that well was that a deal breaker for anybody because I don't remember do I don't remember seeing too many complaints about that kind of thing back then like all the feedback we got basically was uh, like posts on Usenet that's like how you yeah. found out you know it's not like they were like message boards message boards stuff. yeah. So, but were people mostly positive about it from what you remember? People or? were, we did a, we released a demo first that was uh, just like one or two levels. And I remember people just being completely blown away just by the tech, just by the fact that you were moving you smoothly were moving through smoothly. a 3D yeah, world. Yeah. Um, so people basically just like couldn't believe that they were playing this at all. And I think they gave us a lot of slack because of that. And it was before, it was technically, it was before Wolfenstein. It was, I think months. Wolfenstein was just before us. Okay. Um, but it was like a matter of months, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, and of course, that was a very different kind. That was this sort of fake 3D of you're moving mm -hmm. through this, this you know, very two-dimensional world, really. And it's being rendered in this sort of fake 3D. I mean, I shouldn't say fake 3D. But for example, we were using a 3D engine that let you like look up and down. Yeah. And, and Wolfenstein depended on... Like everything being at right angles and you mm -hmm. like looking straight and there were and no stuff ceilings like that. or floors in in that world. They had like sprites or something to suggest it, it but it wasn't right. It wasn't. Um, yeah, it was all. They, I mean, it was really smart. They had this uh, these uh, constraints over what the world could be like, and then they rendered that mm -hmm. really fast. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about, or if you remember, like some of the stuff. Like, do you remember any features or things that? maybe fit in with the simulation aspect of it that were cut eventually or because I, I remember for example reading somewhere once I think it was like a Warren Spector Doug Church retrospective where um, they were talking about um, whether or not you should take damage if you run really fast into a wall uh -huh. and, and that it was eventually decided like no even though that would be realistic and I'm wondering if you remember that or stuff stuff like it. I don't remember th anything off the top of my head that like we tried to put in and then like cut because it didn't work. I think we were went more on the side of like, oh, this pretty much works. Let's leave it in. There may have been some kind of some sort of like more physics based 
puzzles that like we just couldn't get to be mm -hmm. um, consistent enough because we had this this you know full 3D physics system running as well, which was you know not the most robust thing in the world um, either. So there may have been some things like that, but it's hard for me to remember any specific features that we okay. had to cut late. Um, uh, actually, this uh, this reminds me too about uh, before the podcast we were talking a little bit about interface and that Underworld had this this kind of like this crazy like totally mouse driven driven interface and uh, that is like really outside modern standards of what uh, a 3D interface would be and I was wondering if you remember like how that came about or well the 3D interface the standard modern 3D interface didn't exist at that time and so we were kind of making it up by the seat of our pants as we went along and we I think decided we did uh, we supported keyboard movement but we thought that that would be too like abstract and weird we thought that people just wouldn't get that having like their left hand on the keyboard and their right hand on the mouse so we keyboard wanted, and mouse movement you thought was we well, was, well yeah just um people having to like remember these arbitrary keys mm -hmm. like of course now everyone yeah. does that and it's, the, and it's the standard interface so everything i think we put in the keyboard like movement quote cheats like fairly late in the process it was mostly this analog um, mouse movement where the closer you we had these zones over your uh, 3d view and the so if you put the mouse to the right you turn right but to the left you turn left and the farther you were from the center the more you would do it and we thought it was this nice analog method for controlling your movement um, but you could creep yeah using that. by we, going really by yeah. putting the mouse like just above just the center bit, yeah um, but the main problem was that it just didn't interact with using the mouse to do any of the other things you want to do, like interact with objects or you know fire your weapons at enemies or whatever. So you'd have these like if you were trying to like run away from someone and then turn around and then fire your bow at them and then right, run yeah. up to them and fight with your sword. It was just you were trying to use your mouse to do everything, and it was very awkward. It, it was interesting though in the sense that I remember playing it. Um, it was a game. It was a 3D game that you were able to play with one hand, uh -huh. which was. In, I just remember finding that interesting at the time. When right. I, it was probably easier to play uh, with two, like if you actually used the keyboard to move. But we did design it as a game that you were playing just with your mouse. Is is that? Um, did that have a lot to do? Was that like a holdover, I guess, from kind of Ultima? Because Ultima had actually kind of a, Ultima Seven. I remember had kind of had like a similar mouse interface. Yeah, Ultima Seven, I guess, was being came out at around the same time that Ultima Underworld did, which was a little unfortunate for us in terms of just um, you know how much attention got paid to us. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, we may have seen like builds of that at around the same time, but yeah, I think we just um, felt that it should be like this generally a mouse interface. Hmm. Um. The uh, there was one more thing I wanted to ask about Underworld, which was the um, I know that uh, at the time the uh, the scrolling three D movement was kind of like the oh my god I've never seen anything like this and I, I guess I'm wondering was that part of like the original pitch was it like we have to do like this scrolling three D thing and that's going to be what makes this game special or was that something that kind of came along later and was it like a really difficult challenge or no, not so much? That was totally there from day one. I mean, that was before I showed up. Mm -hmm. Basically, um, Paul, who had made Space Rogue, knew um, this other guy, uh, Chris Green, who I think now works at Valve, uh, who is this graphics whiz who had come up with this uh, super optimized texture map, like real-time mm -hmm. texture mapper um, that they thought would enable uh, us to render a game in in real time 3D like that. So that was the core of the game idea like all along. Like, okay, now that we, we have this tech, we'll make a real time first person 3D dungeon game um, that came before anything else. Hmm. Um, it, it's kind of interesting. Uh, when we had uh, Austin Grossman in here, he said something about um, the fact that the real timeness of that 3D space was so new that, at least in his imagination and in some people's minds, it clashed with some of the 
more abstract conventions like the conversation. And um, I'm just wondering if you were one of the people that thought that or if you didn't mind it so much, like the fact that you had this like scrolling 3D world and then it would suddenly cut to another screen. It was weird. Um, yeah, I think we just kind of uh, felt that that was kind of how we had to, there was no other way to do it, right? For mm -hmm. one thing, um, the, 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 the monsters and people in the game, for example, were rendered as sprites. Yeah. And you could sort of imagine that you could sort of picture yourself basically like being in this world, moving around it and seeing these, these characters. And you could kind of imagine that you were actually there. It made some sense. But if we tried to then go to some conversation while like, while somebody was chasing you, or, see, or well, something. and suddenly, and like you, you know, now they're just all like frozen there, yeah. like, it, like would make it. So we decided like that. We sort of, since we couldn't really like render that stuff, we kind of had to abstract it mm. all out and say like, okay, now you're going into the like sort of text based, based mode of the conversation, and then like we'll take you like back out afterwards. The whole thing with um, yeah, dealing with the the real time three D ness of it. Uh, not just being in 3D, but just the very analogness of it. Like you can, you're not just moving a quote square at a time, mm. right? You're you're doing whatever. It was a real pain for us in a lot of ways. A lot of things that would have been uh, really easy to do from a design standpoint became a pain when you're doing everything in terms of this analog world mm. with physics. Like I remember, I was working on the combat AI for monsters, and one of the main things that they were doing that we had to make them do when they're fighting you is make sure to stay uh, far enough away from you so that they looked good. So they're like, they're constantly <laughs> trying to stay. And it's like, it's a, it's a weird distance. It turns out to, that like, they're like trying to stand like 10 feet away from you or something. Right, so okay. sprite will, this, their sprite will fit on the screen. Oh, but okay. like half of the combat logic is just devoted to them trying to look good on screen, you know, because they're very vain or something. Oh, okay. um, instead of just trying to deal the maximum damage to you they can. Well, there's something kind of weird with the perspective, too, because there's a, there's a very small window uh, in that game, which I remember was widened in, in the um Yeah, that's basically, game. it was all the pixels that we could uh, yeah. <laughs> that we could draw and still have a decent frame rate. Back when decent frame rate meant, you know, 10 frames a second. Who, who This actually just reminded me, thinking about the screen, who did the, I remember in the first game, there were these cute little dragons that shut their eyes when uh -huh. things start to go bad, like in your UI. I just... Was, do you remember where that came from? or That was like probably um, the main uh, 2D artist who is Doug Wyke. Um, I bet that uh, that was like, we just were saying, oh, we could do this thing. And he said, okay, here's the animation. <laughs> yeah. And we coded it up. Okay. Um, now, now, actually, there's something I, I forgot about. But did you, did you do the music or part of the music? or I co-wrote the music for Underworld 2. For Underworld yeah. 2. Yeah. Okay, so that was something that you got into later in the in this. In the, well, why don't we why don't we uh, do uh, one of the things that I I thought was um, interesting. Um, one of the things I wanted to ask you about with two is you were talking about the difference between Underworld and those kind of like block step kind of things, like the dungeons in like Ultima, you know, one through five, right. or think. even the outside world in in those Ultimas, because you're still moving in blocks, right, right. Um, there was this weird kind of parody of that in Underworld 2 that I remember where like you go inside somebody's dream and then like suddenly you're in like an Ultima 5 dungeon and everybody's like a stick man. Uh -huh. And uh, do you remember this? I remember it. I didn't do much, <laughs> uh, much uh, work on Underworld 2, but I remember that. Again, I think part of it was just like, hey, we have the technical ability to do this stuff. Okay. It, would be, it would be fun uh, was to it, do that. Was it the same? Uh, you might not remember also, but, but I just that the... the um, there was a Qbert level in Underworld Two. There was like because because Pac Man was in the first game, so there was right. like there was Qbert. There was the also um, a reference to Underworld in Underworld One to um, there was this uh, there was this puzzle. I think it was even called like the Bullfrog Puzzle or something, oh. where you like there were these levers you used to like raise and lower different parts of a room so you could get somewhere, and that was a reference to bullfrog games that was doing games like uh, Populous and things like where you like a god and you could change the, the oh. world. So that was that was another like, <laughs> wow. industry like inside, in joke. Inside yeah. in joke, wow. So yeah, we were doing that all over the place. I think that in especially in games like 
Ultima, I don't know, there was always, um, y y there was this sense of playfulness that like it was okay to put in like random references like that and it somehow didn't seem like it like didn't fit in the world or and something. And you're saying that maybe those inherited that a bit from the main Ultima yeah. franchise. Because it had, because I remember in Ultima you could find stuff like Calvin and Hobbes books or something in Britannia and like these other there were all, always all sorts of like weird references references yeah. to the to the real world um so so you said that so you were kind of like so you were a programmer and um kind of like kind of like story high level story wrangler in underworld one and then it was music in underworld two was that the only thing in underworld two or pretty much I probably did some sort of tech support um, on Underworld 2, like I probably was still maintaining the AI systems and, and stuff like that. Um, but uh, I was mostly, at that point, uh, moving on to the game Terra Nova, which took um, many years to wow, finish. Wow, Terra Nova was started that early? Terra Nova was started in 92, I think, yeah. Oh, wow. And came out early 96. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> okay, that's really interesting. But uh, just to get back to Underworld oh, 2 sure, for a sec, sure. um, what happened was, um, I forget why we, um, old Underworld 1, the music was done um, by the fat man and the people he uh Oh, he remember. worked with who was like the big like music I game music that. guy. I remember that. Um, yeah. um, Didn't he also do time. stuff for for the main Ultima series? I remember the Fat he Man being a lot of was, origin game. Credits. Yeah, he was like Mister Game Music. Yeah. Um, and I forget what the reason was that whether it was scheduling or or budgets or whatever, we decided not to go with them for Underworld Two. And I said, "Hey, I can write the music. I I, I actually my." degree uh at the time from mit was actually music composition oh really? i picked i was uh majoring both music composition and computer science i didn't finish my computer science thesis until like three years later oh, really so um i said hey i can write the music and um uh the guy uh seamus blackley who we had recently uh hired to do physics he was a physics uh had a physics doctorate um and he was like a jazz pianist and so we said like hey we could just give us a week off from uh from regular work and we'll go and like hole up in james's apartment and we'll like write all the music for underworld 2 so that sounds so that's really interesting to me do you have you have you can you talk a little bit about like the aesthetic choices you made or like what like did you want to make it consciously different were you trying to make it fit with the dimensional theme or, or whatever i'm just curious if you could we definitely uh, tried to make all of the um, the musics per dimension sound different um, from each other. So, like, there is this sort of like weird extra dimensional world where we had this very tried to make this like spooky music, and there was some sort of like medieval. I guess everything is a little medieval, but there was some like medieval keep that we tried to have a more medieval sound to, and the there was like the ice world that. I, I tried to make very kind of icy, you know, like with like plucked strings and, uh -huh. and stuff like that. So there was a, a definite attempt made to do that. But the, the main, then there was also the main theme of the game as a whole, which we then tried to sort of sneak into each world, like oh, in a different okay. way. I don't know how much it came out, it came across, uh, but often there would be, the theme would be rearranged in some way. Okay. Uh, or it would be, um, you know, I remember there was the sewer waltz when you went down into the sewers <laughs> below the castle. Is that what you called it? Uh, yeah, we called it the sewer waltz um, because we took the main theme and we made a a, a waltz out of it. But oh, it would generally come that back. Is, so, so, and that's something I, I mean, I suppose I would have to go back and play it. But I remember the music being a little bit more maybe ambient in Underworld 1. Uh, I mean, there was the crazy fight music, which I remember right. like, was like getting kicked in the face in Underworld 1. It was like there was no sound and then suddenly like, a thousand instruments go just right. kind of go crazy. And then you get it again thirty seconds you get later. It again, when like you... thirty seconds later, yeah. yeah. But but um, but no. And two, I do remember that. I remember that you have like the main theme, and then and there's like there's a lot of like subtle, um, yeah, very subtle uh, repetition of familiar elements. Yeah, which was not so much in the first game, at least not that I remember. And of course, we were working at the time in MIDI and MIDI with that you could play. I don't know, like four or five like voices at a time. Mm -hmm. So the arrangements had to be 
uh, extremely sparse, which was a big challenge on us so as was, well. It was music, just music for you, not sound design? Right. I actually did the sound effects in Underworld 1. Oh, okay. Um, everybody, everything had to be done by someone, yeah. and we only had programmers and artists. So um, I did the sound effects on Underworld 1, which I couldn't even really tell you what the tech was. We used this weird uh, sound effect system that Origin provided us, and there was this graphical editor for changing parameters, and I, I, that's all I can remember. About. I remember <laughs> trying to tweak this thing for hours, trying to get something to sound vaguely like a you know, door opening or... Uh, something splashing in the water. So it was all like, uh, so there was not a lot of recorded audio. It was a lot of simulated kind of right. sounds. Yeah, it was all actually synthesized in Underworld 1, at least, except for, of course, um, the uh, like the voiceovers in the, of course. In the intro. Yeah. Um, I don't remember if we moved to like actual recorded, like digital sound in Underworld 2. Certainly we had by System Shock. Yeah, there, there were definitely... It's kind of, I would have to go back and check, but, uh, but I do have a vague memory that there may have been some more recorded sounds in two, but I'm not entirely sure. That makes sure. sense. Um, for some reason, I'm thinking that Doors opening had a recorded sound, although I may be wrong. I may be thinking of, like, I don't know, Ultima 8 or something. Maybe my synthesized opening door sound was just that it was good. So, it was so good, yeah. yeah it, was so, it was very convincing. Um, so uh, I'm actually really interested in now that you've mentioned Terra Nova, I'm I'm because that's because from my perspective as as a fan of I kind of came to um, Looking Glass through Origin just as a fan and I was like what is this Underworld thing right and then I kind of really became a Looking Glass fan and got into all the games, um, but Terra Nova is actually one I didn't know about until a few years later and I was like what they made this game too and then I remember going back and. Uh, playing it uh, sort of a few years after it came out and then uh, going like, oh my God, this has like full motion video cutscenes and all this kind of stuff. And I was just wondering is if this is like a story you could tell or a story that you have something to say about, just like how that whole game came about, why was it so long in development and et cetera, et cetera. I'll, I'll, I'll try starting from the beginning and, and you can interrupt me whenever. Sure, sure, sure. Um, so it actually started, yeah, I think in 92, which was when Underworld 1 came out, so that was being, we, we were then doing two projects uh, in parallel, Underworld 2 and Terra Nova, and we had hired a new programmer, and he had this vision, he was really passionate about doing this powered battle armor game, where you had a squad and you were going around on some planet in your powered battle armor, um, fighting enemies, sort of like a Starship Troopers kind of thing, mm -hmm. and his vision for it was that it was like, again, sort of like the super simulation-y realistic thing where we modeled everything extremely realistically and, and the AIs, you know, were acting um, also very, mm -hmm. very realistically. And it was al almost more of a simulation uh, than a game. And so I started working on that as the AI programmer and then over time, like all these years kind of start blending into another, one another for me. But um, uh, he, he left after a while and the game was a little bit in limbo. And then I became the lead programmer, I think, just kind of because there was a, a void to fill and I just kind of bubbled up to it. This was your main um, project at that this time? This was the main, yeah, my main project at that point, which is now by now, you know, 93 or something. So, like, this is would have been a, the same time System Shock? So, yeah, so Underworld 2 st started and finished, and then System Shock okay. started, and we were still uh, still working on this thing. And, and part of the problem was because we had no fixed end date for it, or I don't know, maybe we did. Um, <laughs> it didn't seem like you did, yeah, or you don't. Right. Yeah. It, we were kind of trying to go with the same philosophy of like, oh, we'll just develop all the systems and then like a game will sort of come out of it. But the game, the goal kept sort of changing. And I think also once this programmer left, like there was no one left who was really psyched about making it this like this really good simulation. Mm -hmm. um, but we still kind of inherited that vision and never really thought to change it. So we were having... I think trouble trying to um, stay to that vision while it was first of all very difficult and if we had 
just like stepped back from it and said like, hey, can we re uh, target you know where we're going? Maybe we'll find something better. Um, there were also you also get into this problem when you're making games that take a long time. Of there's this arms race with the rest of the world. So originally, I think it was mostly going to be um, the game was going to be these missions. You go and, and do these missions on the planet, and then uh, and maybe in between there would be quote cutscenes that would just be like basically either like static graphics or kind of you like know wing commander or kind of, kind of wing commander yeah. one type yeah type stuff and then as other games and other origin games actually um, became like started doing more interesting cutscenes and started doing full motion video it was decided this sort of decision came down from above for us like okay we need full motion video or else no one's going to take our game seriously this would have been probably around like 95 yeah 94 95 commander 3 now. i think was like 95 maybe okay like 95 that was probably the thing that made us say like okay we absolutely have to do that so now um we have this game that's already late and now half of our resources are being poured into doing the, the full motion video which um, you know, if you look at it now, it's pretty cheesy. And in fact, if you looked at it then, it was pretty <laughs> cheesy too. Um, and that was a giant distraction as well. But basically, like a game like like that at the time, just sort of had to have these full motion video game cutscenes to be taken seriously. How does that? How did the full motion video sit with your uh, production process? So, like, you know, if you're a programmer, what does the decision to oh, we, now we have to have full motion video cutscenes? How did that affect you? day to day because it's somebody else really shooting it right i mean right well also well at this point i had uh somehow graduated from uh ai programmer to lead programmer to project director okay. so i actually had to deal with stuff on a higher level than just the, okay okay just the, the programming now it was so it was a big distraction uh for well for me in that sense and also like designers ha now had to make um you, they were trying to tie things in the missions back to the to the video scenes because the the video scenes often would be reacting to what happened in the mission or mm. setting up what happened next um there were tons of script rewrites um it was just um so it didn't affect the programming itself all that much it was more just like extra budget extra time for the designers and and me i know that um from what I've talked to um, of other folks, like so Underworld 1, 2, and System Shock, um, didn't really have, uh, like you were saying with Underworld, like uh, hired writers so much. It was just like the people in the company. Um, is that also the case with the full motion video of Terra Nova? Or was it more like a like a farmed out kind of like Hollywood kind We of had thing? someone outside do that. Um, I'm trying to remember. We had... Like we, we had people give us like pitches or like maybe like, you know, a couple of pages scenes to see if and if we'd like them. And uh, some guy had what, they would like, write stuff for you and send it to you and ask you if this is OK or, well, or I think it's like what, when we were trying to find a script writer. Oh, I see. So we said, like, here's Samples. like a setup for a scene. Yeah, yeah. Give us a sample of like how the scene might go. And I remember that one guy like had this totally crazy stuff with like aliens and like a guy one guy was like a head in a vat and like it was just like <laughs> totally nuts and i'm trying to remember like i want to say that like we actually used him and then forced him to dial everything down because it was so okay. too weird and then it all became kind of generic sounds like he was but, writing like a doctor who episode <laughs> he like probably was crazy. like yeah. when he started it was this total gonzo thing that like <laughs> and ended up everything got really like smoothed out um Anyway, with then, like, at some point, um, basically, Terra Nova had to ship or, like, you know, like, the company was going to go under or mm. something or we were just going to cancel it. So, right, with a few months left, we actually completely changed the game entirely and made it much more arcadey and less simulation-y so that now you were basically, instead of, like, all the simulation, you were just, like, going around, like, blowing people up. And, <laughs> and it was very... Um, uh, if you played it, you know, people that your enemies have sort of these brackets on them showing their health in mm -hmm. like various directions. And it's very like bright and glowy and red and green. And, yeah. Um, so it, all of that kind of stuff is sort of like what, what went in at the end and it made it 
uh, way more fun. Um, and so the game actually, by the very end, like the game six months before it shipped was not fun at all. And it, mm. we actually ended up shipping something that was uh, at least <laughs> somewhat enjoyable to play. I, I, I mean, I, I see people, you know, I have kind of a negative experience overall just because the whole thing dragged on uh, forever. Um, but I know that uh, there are people who regard it highly, so it can't have been <laughs> that, well, that terrible. I've played. I've played a few missions of it, and I remember. I remember thinking it was fun. Um, what I am curious a little bit about when you say it was more simulationy, um, can you give a few examples of what exactly that means? Because it's making me think of like something like Steel Battalion, which is like this you know <laughs> crazy game that like erases your save if you eject from your robot. <laughs> you know, so like what. Well, one thing I remember, maybe this is a, a little off of the, like the game simulation, but the physics simulation for a while, um, one of the uh, big features of it, of Terranova, was going to be our amazing physics simulation. Uh, uh, Seamus, the physicist who, uh, who co-wrote the Underworld 2 music for me and then went on to lead uh, Flight Unlimited and then mm -hmm. became like the head of the Microsoft Xbox team, um, had... Uh, this physics code that he was working on to like simulate a, a biped, a person with two legs. So that was going to be like the best simulation ever and be super realistic. You know, these days, um, this kind of stuff is standard, but at the time, like no one was doing this. So we spent months trying to get this stuff work. And the problem was like, it, it almost always worked, but it wasn't uh, robust. So, you know, once every 30 minutes, like someone would like, <laughs> put his foot down slightly wrong and then you'd see him kind of like like shake for a couple <laughs> seconds and then he'd go like flying off across the map ejected into space because some you know some equation divided by zero somewhere and suddenly like everything blew up were these the robots when you say the bipedal robots yeah, or were these just yeah it was you in your powered battle armor okay, okay. and and your and your squad mates and the enemies okay and um so, i was going to say did it did it look really different or was it more just like like it when looked, it moved it looked uh you know, nice and realistic in the way mm -hmm. it moved when it worked, when it worked well. Um, and so eventually we decided after a long time that it, we just couldn't get this to work robustly enough for a shipping game. And we switched to a very simple model where basically everybody's in an invisible hamster ball, you yeah. know, that's interacting with the environment and then had to make work to then sort of Pretend, do all the animation to pretend that the person yeah. actually is moving their legs around and putting their feet on the ground. Did you, could you, in the more physics-based variation, could you jump as high? Because when I was playing it, I remember a very kind of like bouncy robot kind of a thing where you could just like bound over hills. And right, stuff. I think we did that. Intent well, you had this sort of turbo thing, I think, that you could turn yeah, on so yeah, you could like, do that. Like we turned that on. I think we may have even amped that up because it was fun uh -huh. to go, you know, bounding around okay. all over the place. Um. That's actually there. There may be no connection in terms of, uh, in terms of like actual staff and people going to work on it. But it's just interesting talking about um, physics and simulation as a kind of uh, design focus or a kind of like a philosophical focus. Um, what you were just saying reminded me of uh, when Austin was in here talking about Trespasser and how like there was this. Which Seamus, uh, the physics guy, was actually the project director on. Oh, well, there you go. So, <laughs> so yeah, because that's, yeah, I'm, I guess that's, yeah, that's what I'm wondering. It's like, is the, seems like there's a concern with the same set of issues, right? Like, you know, we really want to do interesting physics simulation. We really want to do an interesting world simulation. And we keep trying to put that in games. So you get stuff like Terra Nova, and then you get stuff like Trespasser, right. which, um, uh, I know in the case of Trespasser, uh, a lot of people criticize it, but it does have a really interesting, it does have really interesting simulation aspects to it. And it sounds like in that case, even though they did cut a bunch of stuff at the end and try to make it into more of a fun game, it sounds like in the case of Terra Nova, it sounds like maybe more of those decisions were made in terms of cutting the things perhaps to try to get it to like a fun state. Yeah, I think we we made probably, a, a we, we made a pretty wide turn mm -hmm. um near the end like once we kind of like figured out we what our goal really should be and then we weren't um uh, shy about like making a 90 degree turn to to do that okay that is really interesting uh um i know uh was that something that um was that was that you said you left in 96 yes so was that your last thing Terra Nova, I, or after Ter so Terra Nova came out in early 96 
And then I was actually the project director for Thief for a few months. Okay. Um, before I got uh, lured away by a couple of my former uh, MIT classmates to work at Harmonix, which was at that point just another tiny startup yeah. with around seven people. Um, and I handed off Thief to our, like the head of our audiovisual department, whose name uh, was Greg Piccolo, mm. who then later came to Harmonix is now our VP of product yeah. development. So, um, just uh, out of curiosity, um, since you were kind of at uh, you were uh, working on Thief at like the very, very, very beginning, I know that project went through a lot of changes. What do you remember? Like what it was at the beginning? Or uh, well, like at the what... very beginning, um, it was uh, a game called Dark Camelot. Uh, which was it was a like a Arthurian uh, game where um, you know that was supposed to be grim and and you know, I think um, I'm trying to remember like the the you know the the enemy the villains like Mordred and and stuff yeah, like you yeah, know yeah. Had, were more had more complex motivations maybe you even like played one of them I don't know. Um, I, I seem to remember, I've heard it described as the Arthurian le legend from the perspective of Mordred. Okay, that makes sense. <laughs> you could probably, which, which you kind of like, it's like, my dad's a jerk, you know, right. which, is, which makes a lot of sense. Uh, and then, I don't remember whether it was just like we, we thought that that wouldn't like fly as like a mass market thing, mm -hmm. but it got turned into this. Um, so at that point, it was that the main idea of it was about uh, like simulating swordplay. Another like a big so, thing. so another kind of simulation yeah. idea, like let's take this one thing that's never been done before at this level of simulation fidelity and try to do it. Right. And it sounds like that's kind of like a reoccurring thing with a lot right. of the games. And you're saying in the case of Thief, it was swordplay. Yeah, which then that kind of took a back seat. And I I don't remember which came first. Like the idea, like we so we were trying to think of different. Um, Kind of settings, kind of genres that we could do the sort of gameplay in, and then we got to the, the "you're a thief" idea, which seemed pretty cool. And is that then, why you were still there? While I was still there, yes. While you were still there, okay. Um, but you said is that why you were still there? Oh. <laughs> <I was> like, <laughs> yeah. That convinced me to stay. Um, and that then led to this the sneaking yeah. kind of mechanics, which were not really a part of the original, you know, Dark Camelot concept. Well, that's at all. why it was the Dark Project, not Thief, the Dark Project, right? Originally, no. I remember. I remember hearing that sword fighting story from a lot of people. I think okay. Ken Levine at one point uh -huh. mentioned that, where he was kind of like, "Yeah, we were just trying to do stuff with swords, and the swords didn't really work. So we tried to come up, think of a game where we had a reason to why you were a bad sword fighter. <laughs> it, it sort of simulated being a bad sword fighter really well. And uh, I remember, even though it's kind of sluggish and weird, I really liked the sword play in that game. Mm -hmm. And and I think late in later games, they took Garrett's weapon and made it into a dagger, which I guess makes a little bit more sense. But I always thought it was kind of right. funny in the original Thief. It was like, he's a thief, but he walks around with this giant sword, you know. That, <laughs> Hopefully no one will notice. That like, you know, nobody would no notice him like with his giant sword. Um, so that's, that's um, okay. So uh, one of the things that I'm, I'm, I'm interested in, in hearing from people on this podcast is um, how the kinds of concerns or, I don't know, design aesthetics, whatever you want to call it, that you had at Looking Glass informed the stuff that sort of maybe you did afterwards, or just like if, if there's any kind of like continuity of experience with, because I, I know that obviously being um, a music guy, doing some music at Looking Glass and then going to harmonics, and I'm wondering if there's any anything you want to say about that or if anything about that strikes you as being like a continuity. The stuff that I've done at harmonics has generally been extremely different from what I did at Looking Glass and, and um, which it's funny like talking about some of this stuff here like reminds me like why I'm so glad not to be doing it anymore. <laughs> things like um, things we were talking about like the, the simulation aspect um, and the stories and the, and the plots you know that's stuff that with games like Guitar Hero and Rock Band are totally absent mm. almost. Um, it's a very constrained environment where the player can do like very discrete things and any sort of extra plot is just like sort of implied we don't mm -hmm. have you know branching plots or or, or physics yeah, the or career like mode this. which is a little narrative but it's right. not but it's really. it's sort of narrative more through it's like a board game kind of narrative yeah. right yeah, it's yeah, like yeah. oh okay now i got this card and now i you know i i got more money um so 
in some way the experience the design experience i had at looking glass kind of informed my design at harmonics in a negative way of like here i know that these kinds of things are really hard let's not try to do them at all instead of trying to do them right or trying to do them a little bit let's see if we could let's try to do games that just like that don't do that them just ignore that entirely because yeah, that that's easier them. than trying to do it a little yeah right? now that's actually really interesting because if i can if it's funny that you say that because it makes a lot of sense it sounds like um in the case of uh maybe underworld and also uh terra nova it seems like you kind of you know understood and respected the whole kind of like let's do an interesting simulation goal but that was never your thing that you were saying i really want to do this it was more like something somebody else wanted to do and you were you worked there so you were trying to work the problem yeah although in underworld i was really psyched about the simulation when we when we started out we had had doug and and terry and i like had this dream back at in college about writing like this big RPG that was just entirely simulated and all the AIs were like, you know, everything with all the characters were total AIs that could had their own motivations and, and everything. And so we were really into the idea of doing a completely simulated like physics-y world. <laughs> and and uh, then when I was trying to actually do, uh, you know, game design and, and programming design on top of that, it becomes clear just how hard that is to do. Was, um, was the, uh, it's funny because when you, when you talk about stuff like that, I mean, I think that even though it's probably not even close to what you were imagining at college, I mean, obviously, like the Elder Scrolls series, at least in the popular imagination, has been trying to carry that torch. And one of the reasons, one of the things that I always, and I like that series okay, but one of the things I always liked about the Looking Glass games is how by focusing on such a controlled situation, you were able to get a lot, in my opinion, a lot more nuance out of some mm -hmm. of the simulation aspects of it. And I'm wondering if... D is was that something that um is that how you saw underworld as being like the fact it, it's funny because it's called ultima underworld it's like ultima underground right so it's kind of this very controlled very constrained environment and uh -huh. uh, did, did that work for you in terms of getting you something that you were excited about like when it was over you were like "Ooh, that was sort of close to what we wanted to make in college or was it not really close at all i think underworld was pretty much the game that that we wanted to make. I think we were all you know, frustrated at the end, like we basically had to like get it out the door and finish it mm -hmm. instead of spending another year like making it perfect, mm -hmm. um, because uh, you know we didn't understand <laughs> what it was like to to be professional game developers, right? We wanted to just work on it for as long as 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 we wanted. But I think it pretty much ended up being the the game that we wanted to make. Uh, in term, but in terms of simulation, was it like 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 when you're saying like we want to do stuff with simulation, we want to combine RPG yeah. elements with simulation elements in a way that results in something that's maybe a little bit more deeper, nuanced, or emergent than you would normally get in like a narrative-driven RPG. And did, did you feel was it satisfying in that way? Yeah, I would say it, it definitely was. We were happy in the way that, that things worked out, and the sort of stories like. You could tell it was a good game because people would tell stories about their experiences with it, right? They'd say like, "Oh, I I was like, I had just killed this guy, and then I was walking down the corridor, and then these skeletons jumped me, and I was at low hit points, so I had to run away. So I ran over here, and then I hid in a room. And that, like, like if people are excited enough about what happened that they like, they turn it into a story in their minds, and that means it was a success. Well, yeah, and that's something that um, I remember having a very strong experience with the game in that way. I remember very I remember getting chased off a cliff and landing in right. the water and then only then realizing that there were octo octopi in there. Right. And then you get like, like carried down the water down and the you water, take you, you end know. up in some strange place you haven't seen before and you have to find your way yeah, back. Yeah. Yeah. It was very the thing I always like to talk about with Underworld is that the uh, even though you talk about the um unstructuredness or incoherence of the story as being like a problem and in some ways it allowed room for the that kind of storytelling, right? I mean, yeah, totally. it, it was really for me, I don't even remember the story of that game because it was just almost like Tom Sawyer, right? It was just like, really the game could have been called, oh my God, I'm trapped in a cave, <laughs> right? And even though it took place in a fantasy world, it had that kind of elemental um, gravity to it, you right. know, just kind of like, oh my, like what would you do in that right. situation? And I, th I think also the fact that it was the first of its kind helped a lot there because you, as the player, um, having this sort of experience for the first time, I think there was sort of a sense of wonder that you got just from being able to explore this environment at all that you wouldn't necessarily get these days when you're playing, hey, it's another 
3D yeah, RPG. Yeah, yet another 3D RPG. And I know some people have been such huge fans of Underworld. There was that, what is it, Arcane Studios? They made this game, Arx Fatalis. Uh-huh. Have you ever played that? No, I remember like reading about it. Do you remember but... hearing about it? It's definitely uh, very much a kind of uh, Underworld attempt to kind right. of... We want Underworld and we can't get enough of it. So it's very much kind of trying to recapture that kind of a thing. Um, you, were, you were asking about like sort of design things that carried forward from, yes, from Looking yes. Glass to, to art to my current games. And there was not, not so much actual in the, actually in the games themselves, but in the sort of theory of gaming that we were all oh, talking sure. about at the time. Um, there was this concept, and I think... Uh, Doug actually got it from someone else, and I don't remember who it was. Of the, he called it the delicious interaction, and basically, uh, the idea was that your game should, like, doing performing the main um, uh, action of your game should just just by itself be really satisfying. And the game that we were playing, all playing at that time, that really had this was uh, like NHL '91 or something <laughs> for like the, the Sega. Is during is during Underworld? While we were doing Underworld, oh, yeah. Okay. And um, just like checking someone into the boards was like so awesome. Like you just wanted to do it again and again. And it's not that. So that was a, a kind of thing we talked about. I don't think it, um, we actually implemented it so much because of the, it was the sorts of games that we had mm-hmm. were, were a little more like abstract in that kind of way. But like, for example, like I think like using your bow in. Uh, thief is kind of like that. It's like really cool, to like to to focus in on something and then like go, mm, that moment, and, yeah, yeah. And then it goes so Re- really different than the bow in uh, Underworld games. I remember, yeah, I remember being really disappointed. I mean, I love the game, but I remember being really disappointed that I couldn't see my bow. And I remember yeah, playing Thief, a going weird. like, "Oh, this is what I always wanted in right in the Underworld games." Um, so, um, just that sort of design principle has informed. Uh, I think things like Rock Band and Guitar Hero a lot, mm. where the goal really is to make that that tiny low level interaction with the game just fun. You know, you press your fret and you strum the bar, and right when this gem is hitting the front of the screen, and you hear this great sound, mm. and you're like, I want to do that again and again. So the idea that um I mean, I've heard that described in terms of, I mean, second, the kind of like the second to second gameplay, right? Like the one thing that you're, like if you just like forget about everything else, the whole meta system, everything else, you know, just like the thing that you're always doing has to be. And I think it's more also kind of, just kind of a physical thing of like the sort of connection from with your, from your fingers to the controller, to the visuals, to your, Mm -hmm. to your ear, just like that, uh, feeling like it's a, a single like awesome interaction that it's all those things there's no it's like all those things functioning in sync and yeah and you're controlling and it, you're you made controlling it happen it, you, you made want to make it happen again yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, you yeah. Know, five seconds later um uh the uh i think um i think that's pretty good uh i actually just wanted to ask you about um antigrav uh-huh did you did you work on that? Or? Yeah, Antigraph was the sort of the one harmonics project that went back to sort of the simulation. Well, yeah, kind that, of thing. that's kind of why because um, it's the only like non music game, right? Yes, yes. Um, what happened was that we had done Frequency and Amplitude, which were these uh, music games for Sony for the PS2 um, that uh, you know got good reviews, but sold modestly, you know, mm. they weren't uh, not terrible, but weren't big hits. And so we wanted to do another music game and Sony said, oh no, we gave you two shots, that's that's enough. But we have this new controller, um, maybe you can do something with it because we know that you do. Like, and that was the I, iToy. Right? iToy, which was yeah. this uh, sort of webcam thing for the PS2. Um, and yeah, so that sort of brought me back to like, all of this. Like I was doing the early um, image recognition Okay. Uh, for that, so like trying to figure out from the camera uh, data, you know, what you were doing. Are you, you know, leaning or what? Where are your hands and and stuff like that, which was kind of a fun research project. But turning that into a game that's going to work in everybody's home, I mm. um, in all these different lighting environments. You know, it's a kind of thing that if it works ninety five percent of the time, that's really cool for like a research project. But it's sucky for yeah. a game. Um, so there were a lot of um, 
uh, issues like getting that done. And, and in fact, there was a similar kind of uh, uh, a path taken from what I was described to, to what I was describing with Terra Nova, where it started out being more simulation-y and we had you going around on your hoverboard through um, environments like city blocks and stuff like that. And more open world? It, it was, yeah, it was a more open world, but also more constrained. Um, okay. Constrained, uh, not in that there's a track, but that there are lots of obstacles, mm -hmm. right? You know, you're on this, say you're in the city, there are all these uh, buildings and, and things like that. And trying to use your body to steer yourself through all of this was really hard. And you hit something mm. that was hard to back up just because of the mm. ways you, there's no backup button, right? Like, yeah. So um, it ended up being uh, pretty frustrating. And what we decided halfway through the project was that we were going to dump all of that. We redesigned all our levels and we turned it into a much more streamlined thing where mm. you're sort of more a marble going down a chute mm. and you can, you can uh, choose what you, you, know, you can sort of go, like, go from side to side down mm. that chute and, and have some uh, some choices there, but it was much more about we're taking you on a journey mm. automatically from point A to point B, and you can you can do things on the way. And we made it more gamey rather than exploration sort of based in that way. Mm. So it was a pretty kind of parallel, a parallel development where you tried the simulation first and decided it wasn't enough of a game. Yeah, were you were you um, happy to go back to music games? after that yes yes i was <laughs> well, um, guitar hero was next right guitar hero was next what happened was we were working on anti-crav wall in parallel with uh uh the game the karaoke revolution games oh that we did. Yeah, yeah um and guitar hero was this tiny little project done with like three programmers mm. um while most of the company was doing the fourth game in the Karaoke Revolution series. Karaoke Revolution Party. Yes, I think. that's correct. Yeah. Um, and, and then you and know then, the rest of the story. Then, yeah, we know. We know uh, but that was a really fun project to work on. It was very um, constrained you know, in its design. Mm -hmm. And um, it, was, it was fun to just try to take this small target and totally nail it. Hmm. Um, well, that's... Uh, that's great. Thank you very much.